From KCRW, I'm Kim Masters, and this is The Business. Filmmaker Eliza Hitman knew she'd have trouble getting financing for her art house abortion drama, Never, Rarely, Sometimes, Always, and she didn't think it helped that she kept finding herself pitching to rooms full of men. Oh, I went to a company that focuses you know, on issue movies, and mm -hmm. they told me they were looking for films that focused more on global problems. I see. Yeah. <laughs> Not just the ones that affect women. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like water. That was what I was told. Hitman eventually got her money and her film, which features an astonishing performance by a young woman who had never acted and didn't particularly want to. The film got raves at Sundance and won the Silver Bear at the Berlin Film Festival. Never Rarely Sometimes Always was set for a theatrical release in March, but you know what happened. It's not the experience Hitman imagined, but now Focus Features has released her movie on demand. Just before Shelter at Home went into effect, we talked to Hitman about her award-winning film. But first, more homebound banter. Stick around, it's the business from KCRW. I am joined by my homebound partner in banter, Matt Bellany of The Hollywood Reporter. Hello, Matt. Hi there. So, Matt, despite this lockdown, which is grinding on and making everybody uh, full of anxiety, AT&T is preceded with a major, major business decision. They hired Jason Killar, the original head of Hulu, back in the day when streaming and Netflix wasn't even a thing, when, it, when Hulu started up, and put him in charge of everything. Uh, CNN, HBO, Warner Brothers Film and Television Studio, and of course, the most important streaming service, the reason why this guy was hired. This is a very radical decision because Jason Killar, who has not really been doing anything of note after leaving Hulu, having made his bosses, who were the uh, traditional studios, mad in that job by telling them that their business model was outmoded, uh, he is not a guy who's run anything of this scale. I mean, this is really, really big. It shows the importance of the streaming service, but you know, for a lot of people in Hollywood, they don't know him particularly well, and there is skepticism about the amount of responsibility and the timing. Yeah, and I think that's kind of the point. I mean, AT&T, since it bought the Warner assets a couple of years ago, the singular focus has been on streaming, and they want to create a viable competitor to Netflix. That is exactly the strategy, and this guy fits that strategy because he has run one of the viable streaming competitors to Netflix, Hulu. You know, he has this reputation as somewhat of a gadfly. He famously fired off a memo to the entire industry, you know, questioning the business model of linear television. And yes, all the know, way back in 2011. Has, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, and he is he is known to be a guy who speaks his mind publicly. But John Stanky, the person at AT&T who hired him, was asked about this by The New York Times. And he said, you know what? A guy who speaks his mind is a guy that I want on my team. So they don't seem to have a problem with that, at least now, when he, <laughs> before he's uh, disagreed with them publicly. Yeah, I mean, this company has been quite top-heavy and confusing in structure with the emphasis on the streaming service, but a lot of people in the industry saying, I don't really get it, who's in charge of what? I mean, Bob Greenblatt is in charge of all of it, hypothetically, but there are all sorts of executives sloshing around. Maybe this Jason Killar can make that coherent, but again, it's the dimension of the responsibility that has struck people and AT&T, you know, they are hidebound. Now, looking back, Jason Killar looks like he was a visionary. He was in this really impossible situation where his bosses were people like Bob Iger at Disney and, and the Murdochs and Chase Carey at Fox, who were running old school entertainment companies. And he was their employee saying, by the way, you don't know what you're doing and the world is changing. And now he's being brought back. I just wonder about the whole thing, honestly, man. I, I have a certain amount of skepticism about what what did they see at AT&T that they did something like this so precipitously when, as one of their competitors pointed out to me, he can't even meet with his staff right now. These, and a lot of these people don't know him. You know, he's not that familiar figure that everybody knows in Hollywood. He can't have a face-to-face -face meeting. Somebody said to me, and again, a competitor, but still, what's the rush? Why do they have to do this right this second? And it makes me wonder what they're seeing with the streaming service, what anxieties they have. I feel like all of Hollywood has made some 
hasty decisions, maybe in some cases. You know, I think the Disney purchase of Fox, which is seventy billion, you know, it leaves them with a lot of debt at a very bad time, as it turns out. Nobody could have known how bad that would be. But but even so, people say, should they have bought Fox? Was it worth it? So I think there's just going to be a ton of experimenting like this, and then second guessing about whether studios were basically kind of uh, panic buying solutions. You know, when it's not so clear what's going to work. Yeah, and I think the fact that HBO Max is about to launch is at least one rationale for getting someone in the door to be the company's leader. And they have been looking for a while. I mean, news surfaced a couple of weeks ago that Kalar had been approached and they were churning the waters. So it's not like this came out of absolute nowhere. The interesting thing is that what you referenced there is this buying spree and realignment that has gone on over the past few years in this run-up in the economy. And a lot of these purchases have been fueled by debt. Disney took on a lot of debt to buy Fox. AT&T took on a ton of debt for the Time Warner purchase. And now in this all of a sudden cratering economy, what are those debt pictures going to look like when these companies start to try to monetize these assets, which is what they're doing with HBO Max? Is the debt question going to pull these companies down in an economy that may not allow it to keep the revenues up? Yeah, um, we will have a lot to cover in terms of what happens in this industry. And I'm not saying it's easy. Trust me, I don't think it's easy to figure the world out before the pandemic and especially now, of course. Meanwhile, somebody has figured out something that might make some people happy. It's a little unclear as we are talking right now, but Amazon has announced that they're going to try an online version of South by Southwest and potentially other festivals that might need this kind of solution. Now, it's unclear as we're speaking which filmmakers will opt into this, but they will get some kind of a fee. Again, what it is is unclear. And for people who might not have otherwise had their films seen, this might be a solution, but we don't know. You know, this is not the dream, but it is a thing that certain people suggested very quickly and Amazon has now gotten going. We don't have much in the way of detail. Well, I think the big value here is for some of these titles that go to these festivals without distribution, hoping for buzz, hoping for reviews, hoping for the accolades that could then push it over the edge to get a theatrical distributor. Perhaps this will provide an alternative option where, you know, they are going to be giving awards, they will have a jury. And if some of these movies, quote unquote, pop out of this virtual festival, perhaps they could find buyers or fans that might be willing to pay for them on VOD. So it is at least a better alternative than nothing and leaving these films stranded. But I don't know if this is going to ultimately replace the festival experience, as some are suggesting. You know, people are saying, oh, well, what do we need a film festival for in the future when life presumably returns to normal? Why don't we just do this virtually? I don't know that the filmmakers and the studios and the entire ecosystem of the film business is going to rally around a virtual model. There is value to having a hot crowd, so to speak, and to go into these festivals and get the buzz you want and jack up the price. And that's sort of the indie film business model. I just don't see this replacing it. Yeah, I mean, there is absolutely nothing like the film festival experience and sometimes to the woe of people who get overexcited as we've seen and pay too much, but no filmmaker is going to feel that this replaces the dream. Well, I will say one thing, though, it's a lot safer. I mean, who hasn't gone to Sundance and come back with a cold or some kind of illness? And now that we live in a world where these you know, pandemics may be a, an annual thing, Perhaps a virtual film festival is an answer to that. Well, it is for now. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. That's Matt Bellany, editorial director of The Hollywood Reporter. In the new drama, Never Rarely, Sometimes Always, first-time actress Sydney Flanagan plays Autumn, a 17-year-old in a hollowed-out Pennsylvania town. Autumn is hardly an extrovert, but she's blessed with a steadfast friend and her cousin Skylar, played by Talia Ryder. The two work as cashiers at the local grocery store. I saw you weren't at school today. I went to the doctor. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. What's wrong? Girl problems. Don't you ever just wish you were a dude? All the time. Autumn is pregnant with no desire or capacity to become a mother. She first seeks help at a local clinic where she gets very bad advice. 
And in Pennsylvania, a minor can't get an abortion without parental consent, a non-starter in Autumn's case. Determined to help her cousin, Skylar lift some cash from the grocery store, and the two set off for New York City, where abortion is an option. Manhattan is alien territory for the two penniless teenagers, and never rarely, sometimes always, follows their journey with restraint and understatement. Filmmaker Eliza Hittman has worked with non-actors in her previous two intimate art house films, It Felt Like Love and Beach Rats, and she did it again here with Sidney Flanagan. When we spoke to Hittman from New York in March, she knew Never Rarely, Sometimes Always might not open in theaters as she'd hoped. You know, doing something more kind of educational and grassrootsy was always in the plan, and, you know, we're working on kind of a non-theatrical strategy as well. Yes, whatever happens, we think that day will come, Mm -hmm. Uh, however long it takes. So this movie is, I actually read somewhere that you called it an art movie, and I feel like it's almost, you know, are you allowed to say those words and still expect to get to make it? It's like, we don't say that, do we? We pretend maybe that it's sort of commercial. I know. You know, It's. I think the movie is a miracle in a lot of senses. You know, I got to make kind of an honest artsy coming-of-age story that deals with abortion that stars non-actors with focus features. So I really, I really feel very lucky. So your idea initially for the film, I think, was setting it in Ireland because you had been reading about these young women or women Mm -hmm. who, you know, they could not get abortion in Ireland. They would take a day trip to, to England Mm -hmm. and, and, be very much out of their normal element, a place where most likely they'd never been before. And that was an earlier idea that ultimately you did not get to make. Yeah, I was reading about, you know, this ferry journey across the Irish Sea and had images of a woman on the run and just, you know, was really compelled by the idea of this journey and how harrowing it must be and who can afford it and how. But I'm obviously, you know, not a UK-based filmmaker. And even though I was interested in that story, I I felt that there was a way to explore it, you know, within the context of our own country. Um, So I just began to, you know, think about it and think about what those challenges and obstacles look like for women in our country. Yes. And who gave you the first bit of money? I mean, I don't know what kind of budget you had or wanted to have if you got more or less the same that you had hoped for? Um, Who gave the first bit of money? You know, I was in England, actually, in London at the London Film Fest with my film Beach Rats, and I met with this incredible producer and the head of BBC Films, Rose Garnett, you know, told her about the Irish version of the story, and then I told her about the U.S. version, and she said, I think you have to make the U.S. version, but I'm still going to support you. So she commissioned the script, and then I began to look for partners in the United States to help produce and find financing for the film. So you have a commission to write the script, Mm -hmm. and then you, I think, Adela Romansky, who I think has been on this show for Moonlight Mm -hmm. with Barry Jenkins, Mm -hmm. is, is she the next stop on this? Yeah, I think the conversation with her was happening in like parallel to the conversation with the BBC. And I actually met Dela Romansky like well before, you know, Moonlight. And she lived in LA and was like a long distance pal. And I lived in New York and we had talked about finding a project to do together. But it, because I had been making work that was so localized and set in Brooklyn, it was hard for me to see how that would work, you know, with a producer in L.A. And as soon as she won the Oscar for Moonlight, she sent me a text that night and said, you know, now will you let me produce a movie for you? <laughs> and I you were said, like, oh, well, now I will. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, OK. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, you we had been looking for a project to do together for a long time. And yeah, this was it. So she comes along, and then I know there's a general sequence where focus comes in. Yeah, well, I guess, you know, the next step was now that I had a production company on board, we had to begin to look for the financing. And, you know, we went out to 
a lot of different companies and private investors and tried to find money for the film. It was not an easy process, and it's obviously not such a easy pitch, you know, this coming-of-age abortion movie. And, you know, there's a weird stigma around issue movies, mm-hmm. and, you know, I got a lot of funny reactions in pitching the movie from to a lot of men in Hollywood. Give me an example. Oh, I went to a company that focuses, you know, on issue movies, and Mm -hmm. they told me they were looking for films that focused more on global problems. I see. Yeah. (laughs) Not just the ones that affect women. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Like water. That was what I was told. Or, you know, I got it sounds like an interesting documentary a lot. Mm. But I think it's okay. I think movies are hard to make, and you find the right partners for the right reasons. And then the BBC ended up being able to put equity into the film, which was unexpected. We didn't expect them to be a financing partner in the movie because it's obviously doesn't have, you know, any real UK connections. But Rose Garnett broke the rules. Um, <laughs> and... You know, we couldn't have made the movie the way that we made it without her contribution. You have a string of uh, of women <laughs> who somehow think this is important. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and the focus, uh, that was striking to me because it seems like they found you almost. Yeah. I had met with a really lovely executive from Focus Features before named Rebecca Arzoian. Um, she's no longer there. She's now at Smokehouse. But... I had talked to her about the project, you know, years before at Sundance. And then I think just very casually and randomly, and one day she was talking to a CAA agent, and she just said, what have you read lately that you liked? And the CAA agent said, oh, I read this script called Never, Rarely, Sometimes, Always. And she said, give it to me. Um, and they sent it to her because, you know, we were casting the film at the time. So it was it was circulating through the agencies, the script. And Rebecca read it. And then within two hours, she galvanized the entire office and made them read it. Um, And that's, you know, how they got involved. And they didn't finance the movie. They're, you know, they're they're distributing the movie. So their their involvement is a little bit different. Um, They weren't involved in, like, a lot of the creative decision making. Like, they never gave notes on the scripts. And they didn't have input over how the movie was cast. Um, but they came in, well, you know. that's probably just as well, but <laughs> distribution is good. Yes, distribution <laughs> is amazing, you know, especially for a movie like this. So casting, this is something where you have used somebody who you had met at a party in Buffalo. I mean, years ago, right? She years was 14 ago. at the she time? She was 14. I think it was 2013. This was Sydney Flanagan. Yeah. My partner who edited the film, who is also an incredible filmmaker, was working on a project, and I was along for the ride helping. And the film is called Buffalo Juggalos, and Sydney was dating somebody who ended up in the movie. And we met her in passing, and... You know, we added her on Facebook, and she is an aspiring musician, and she posted a lot of videos of herself making music alone in her bedroom, and there was something kind of intimate and rough and raw about her videos, and we just followed along uh, and sort of watched her grow up on Facebook through her music. And I actually reached out to her in 2013 to talk about this movie when I was initially thinking about it. And she never wrote me back. She was grounded and wasn't allowed to use Facebook. And then while we were casting this movie, I kept thinking about her for the role and was using her kind of as a reference for the character. And as we got closer and closer to the beginning of prep, we hadn't found our autumn. And I took my producer, Sarah Murphy, aside, and I was like, we have to invite this girl to New York to audition. I know it's really crazy, but I would like to see if she's interested in the project. And Sydney and I started Skyping. I think she was really reluctant and thought the whole thing was random and, you know, had a moment of being like, but I don't act. Like, that's not cool. (laughs) Um... (laughs) And we eventually convinced her to come to New York. Um, And then I auditioned her more formally. And did she get sort of into it, (laughs) bitten by a bug? I don't know. I don't know if she got bitten by a bug. I think she was nervous. You know, it was 
a lot to take on. It was not a happy role. It was not a comedy, you know. There was Hardly, the, no. Is, no, there's an intensity to the experience of making a movie, an intensity to the character and story. I think, you know, Sydney, because she plays music and went to a creative arts high school, public arts high school in Buffalo, she kind of understands the creative process. And I think that there's a lot about her performing music that translated to performing in the film. Coming up after a short break, Eliza Hittman, who is five feet tall, gives advice to other filmmakers who don't tower above the crowd. You're listening to The Business from KCRW. Thank you for listening to this KCRW podcast. In case you don't know us, KCRW is public radio in Los Angeles, bringing the best of NPR to Southern California. We're also known for our own brand of bold and innovative programming, evocative storytelling, taste-making music, and audio documentaries that are little movies for your ears. You can join our community to support this show and others, or make a one-time donation just to say thank you. Find out more at kcrw.com slash join. This is The Business, and I'm Kim Masters. We're talking to director Eliza Hittman about her new film, Never, Rarely, Sometimes, Always, which was supposed to open in theaters last month, but instead is now available on demand. In the movie, Sidney Flanagan plays Autumn, a dead-broke teenager who travels from rural Pennsylvania to New York because she needs an abortion. Making the journey is no easy feat, and neither is navigating the city. But she makes it to a session with a Planned Parenthood social worker, played by Kelly Chapman. Who came with you today? My cousin. Do you have a place to stay tonight? I know you came from far away. I'll figure it out. I want to make sure that you're safe. There's a scene, it's a pivotal scene, that where the t- title of the movie is either derived or inspired. I'm ask you some questions. They can be really personal. Just answer either never, rarely, sometimes, or always. That's a really, like, I can think of a lot of, and I, that's a challenging scene for any actress, I would think. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you shoot that later in the game so she would have more time I to did. I get did. used to acting? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think scheduling can be the key to unlocking really great performances, I think. And we plan to shoot that as you know late into the shoot as possible. You know, on the day that we shot that film, I quarantined her and I put her in a room in Planned Parenthood kind of all by herself so she had time to just be alone and think about the scene. Um, and I really just asked her to personalize it as much as possible and in a way, you know, answer as herself. So when she's asking like all the general questions about family history and heart disease and smoking, you know, she really begins the scene answering as Sydney. This is a series of, yes, the screening questions at yeah. Planned Parenthood. Yeah. Uh, did she find that she just got into that space or yeah, was we it? we did it in a long take and that the take that you see on screen is the first take. Wow. When you see that movie, remember that because, wow, I would just say to people who haven't seen the movie, Kelly Chapman, I, I'm not quite sure what her role. She's a social worker, but what? how did that I, um, blend in to yeah. the plan? I did a lot of research because I was really looking to, you know, have as much perspective on what Planned Parenthood does and other clinics. But I played out different scenarios. I met with social workers and I said, you know, if you were working and a minor came in, you know, how would you treat them? What would your concerns be? And I went to a clinic in Queens, which is where I met Kelly Chapman, and it was called Choices, and she was a social worker there working. And every time I kind of hit a roadblock in the script, I found myself reaching out to Kelly. Mm -hmm. And I spent a lot of time working through that pivotal scene that we were just talking about with Kelly. And then when it came time to cast the film... I really had a hard time imagining anyone but Kelly. How did she respond to that? I think she was excited, and I think part of what makes that scene as effective as it is is that, you know, Sydney is in the hands of a real counselor. It's it's striking because it's clear that Sydney is in trouble in many more ways than one, and yet there's no outreach. There's an offer of help, but not. it's very minimal. Mm -hmm. Well, she doesn't disclose. 
Yes. Well, she does, but she doesn't. She does, but she doesn't. Well, so this film won an award. It won the Silver Bear in Berlin. I mean, were you, (laughs) did that come as a surprise to you? (laughs) Yeah, it was a big surprise. I was in Berlin and I was like, should I stay for the awards? But I didn't want to get ahead of myself or be disappointed. So I got on a plane and I flew back to New York (laughs) midweek. And then as soon as I landed at JFK or Newark, I got an email politely asking if I would mind coming back. (laughs) And that's what I did. I went home and did a small load of laundry and then got back on a plane to Berlin for the award show. But I didn't know how the film would be honored or recognized by the jury. You know, the jury was headed by Jeremy Irons, who in the past had made some very controversial statements about Mm -hmm. abortion. So I was... I didn't think I would get close to the silver or gold bear. Right. I mean, they just say something good is going to happen. You might want to come back to Berlin. Yeah, they just politely asked, you know, that I come back. So I had to sit, you know, through this two-hour award show, watching everything be presented. And then the night was like dwindling and there was only two bears sitting on the stage and I was like oh my god (laughs) (laughs) one of those is my bear (laughs) yes yes so that must have been really thrilling yeah I don't Um, think there's so many American films that have won that bear and I don't think there's so many you know female filmmakers in the world who have won that bear so it's a triumph on many levels so that is a huge triumph and congratulations on that meanwhile in between and betwixt you've done some TV. And I wanted to just ask you a little bit about that Mm -hmm. because uh, I've read you have contrasted experiences. You did, uh, I think, High Maintenance Mm -hmm. for HBO, Mm -hmm. which was a good experience, but I was more interested in the 13 Reasons Mm -hmm. Why Not So Good Experience. I don't know if I should rehash that. Um, Maybe it's not the best idea. Oh, okay. You know, it was a challenge. You know, whenever you step onto somebody else's set, it's a challenge. And also a privilege. But yeah, it was a hard experience and it made me sort of eager to get back into my own space, my own artistic space. Well, let me just without going into the actual thing, mm-hmm. is it is it that you feel that you just ought not to have expressed the criticism? Maybe. Because consequences could flow that are unforeseeable? No, because I think that ultimately, I think Paramount, you know, who produced the show was happy with the work, you know, that I did and... You know, there are other projects that are being discussed, and I don't know. I don't know the best way to navigate all these situations. There were a lot of challenges with that show. Hollywood is small. Yeah. Uh, and this is the kind of thing that makes my job hard <laughs> because <laughs> everybody doesn't know where their next meal is necessarily yeah. coming from or who they're going to encounter. Yeah. So that is a challenge of dealing with the media. Yeah. Oh, I was going to ask you one more thing. Mm-hmm. I read that you are five feet tall. That you, you, you had been told at one point in your career by someone that mm-hmm. you were going to have trouble because yeah. of that. Yeah. Is that a real thing? Is it trouble? I think so. I think people think they can dominate more petite women. For the petite directors out there of any gender, is there advice? Do you do something to try to make it clear that you want to be heard? No, I think, you know, you just try and work people who respect you, and that's key. Try and set the right tone for the kind of sets you want to be on. And, you know, it's a little bit why I'm wary to kind of step back onto an episodic environment, you know, where you have to sort of earn people's trust and respect quickly. I think that's a harder negotiation as a petite woman. Eliza Hittman is the writer and director of Never, Rarely, Sometimes, Always. Thank you so much for coming in, not to L.A., but at least we have you in New York. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And that's the business. Caitlin Parker produced and edited today's program, and Paul Smith mixed the show. Mario Diaz is part of the essential KCRW staff still going into the studio. He helped us this week. Thank you, Mario. You can stream the business as well as other great KCRW podcasts on the KCRW app. I'm Kim Masters. We'll see you next week on The Business.